So what do you remember from your past life? <laughs> it almost seems like everybody remembers the same thing. They were all princesses in Egypt. <laughs> the first thing we know about past lives is that we don't remember them. Now this can be attributed to simply the uh, trauma of birth because the soul comes with its memories. The soul certainly doesn't forget. So why don't we know our past lives? It could be the uh, trauma of birth because the past life that we're all very familiar with is the immediate past life. What is everyone's immediate past life? Nine months in the womb. During the, those nine months, the soul experiences many things. And they're almost all positive. The soul is taught the entire Torah during those nine months. And that can't be bad. And yet, the minute we're born, we forget it all. So it's not surprising that we don't remember the time we spent in heaven when we can't even remember the time we spent in the womb. So there are people who argue or assume that there is no memory and that the fetus in the womb does not think or feel or experience. And so there's nothing to remember. And all of life begins at birth. And even that we don't really remember very well, do we? Comedian says he found the diary that he had been keeping since the day he was born. The entry on the first day, still tired from the move. <laughs> Second day, everybody talks to me like I'm an idiot. We don't remember even being born. But we've now discovered that it's not true that the fetus has no thoughts or feelings or experiences. The exact opposite is true. The fetus is an entire complete human being. And the only thing it's missing is the power of speech. Because there's nobody to talk to anyway, so why should he have? So the only thing a fetus is missing is articulation. But every experience, every emotion, every thought, every idea, every conversation, it hears it, it remembers it, it understands it until the moment of birth. And then it's all erased. So tradition has it that an angel comes along and makes you forget. But the birth trauma itself is enough to make you forget. The transition, the change from in life in the womb to life outside the womb, that is shocking enough, traumatic enough to make you forget. In fact, we really need to explain or understand how it is that that trauma doesn't destroy us altogether. How come it doesn't cripple us more than just re erasing our memory? <clears throat> now, not everybody's memory is erased equally. There are people who do remember being born. And they remember being fetuses. Some of those people are tzaddikim, in whom there is no forgetting. They forget nothing. They remember being in heaven. They remember leaving heaven. They remember being conceived. They remember being a fetus and they remember being born. They forget nothing because forgetfulness comes from unholiness. In holiness, nothing is forgotten. Then there are other people who are not tzaddikim, but they also have some memory. And those memories torture them because I guess we're not supposed to remember. So there are people who have this uh, ESP, they remember things, they see things, they know things that other people don't know. And it disturbs them. It's a little too much. And they'd rather not know. But they can't block it. They can't stop that flow of information. But as a rule, we forget. We forget those wonderful months, which at ta in, in different places in Torah, those nine months in the womb, are actually referred to as heaven. So when it says the soul before it came down to earth while it was in heaven, it could be talking about those nine months in the womb because they're heavenly, even though it's very physical, but it's heavenly. Would there be a virtue 
in remembering our past lives or discovering our past lives? Obviously not. If there were virtue to it, then God would allow us to remember or cause us to remember or help us to remember. And he hasn't done any of the above. So the retrieval, going back through regression or whatever it is that they use to get in touch with a past life, it doesn't really do any good. It's fascinating, of course. It's a little speculative. You can never be quite sure that what you're retrieving is true and not imagination. But all in all, even if the retrieval is correct, what does that do for you? So, for example, a person has a problem with, um, let's say, stinginess. A person is very stingy, can't share, can't let anybody into their life. So they regress through whatever, and they get in touch with a past life. And in a past life, they had the same problem. So what does that do for you? It's fascinating. But it doesn't make you any more generous. It doesn't help you be any more generous. It just tells you that you've had this problem for a long time. Which could actually be even discouraging. But knowing that there were past lives, without remembering them, is a very important piece of information because it does help us be moral and godly and good. Because knowing that there's a past life is all part and parcel of knowing that there is a mission. See, in Buddhism, if you know a little bit about Buddhism, reincarnation is an automatic process. Everything is recycled. Everyone is recycled. Constantly, endlessly, pointlessly. If you want to get out of that, if you want to stop being recycled endlessly and pointlessly, then you have this discipline of meditation and so on, where you can attain enlightenment, and then you won't be reincarnated anymore, and the cycle will stop. This is probably part of the philosophy that Avraham, on his own, discovered before God spoke to him. See, God first spoke to Avraham when Avraham was 75 years old. Prior to that, he had discovered God on his own, was worshiping God as best as he knew how, but he hadn't heard from God. When Avraham was 75 years old, God appeared to him and said, I really like what you've come up with, that's great, but <laughs> let me tell you my side of the story. Let me tell you what it looks like from where I sit. And he said, leave your place, meaning your philosophy. Leave your father's home, meaning your habits, as good as they are, as wonderful as they are, and you were willing to die for them because it was monotheistic. It's wonderful, but come to the land that I will show you and be my special family or people. And, so and that's when God told him the rest of the story. So if Avraham had discovered that souls are reincarnated, God now let him know how, when, and why. And what God told him is, souls are not reincarnated pointlessly and endlessly. Every soul has a mission. There's a certain amount of goodness that each soul is supposed to contribute to this world. And all the contributions together make the world perfect. But if a soul does not make its contribution or complete its contribution in one lifetime, it is given a second lifetime to finish the job. It is not pointless or endless. It's purposeful, it's planned, and it has an end because every soul will fulfill its purpose. If not in one life, then in two. And if not in two, then in three. But it will fill its quota of goodness. So the way it works is something like this. It's very unusual for a soul to spend 80 years or 100 years on earth and not accomplish at least part of its mission. Very unusual, very unlikely. Therefore, when a person dies, that part of the soul that had accomplished that amount of goodness or that area of goodness, 
So for example, the person was successful in all matters of kindness. Charity, hospitality, friendship, was very good at that. So that quality of his soul, let's say the chesed of his soul, had achieved all it was meant to achieve. But on the other hand, when it came to um, when it came to perseverance and determination and strength and discipline, it didn't do such a good job. So what happens? The chesed of his soul, that dimension of his soul, remains in heaven because it is complete. But the gvura of his soul, the uh, severity, the, the strong force in his soul, which did not complete its mission, it will come back for another life. And of course, it'll have the same problem or the same challenge because it's meant to fix what it didn't fix before. So it has to face the same issues, deal with the same problems, and get it right the second time around. So the person will be born again. He will again be weak when it comes to discipline and to perseverance, and he will have a chance to get it right. When he gets that right, it's still possible that a third part of his soul had not accomplished its quota of goodness. Let's say, for example, um, influencing others, which is the attribute of malchus. Or he didn't get married and didn't have children and didn't contribute to the next generation, which would be yesod. So again, the part of the soul that finished its job will stay in heaven. The parts of the soul that didn't will come back until the entire soul is completed. At this point in history, pretty much the close of history, we have all been here before. And that's important to know, even if we don't know where our past life was and what our name was in that life. But knowing that we were here before, knowing that we have accomplished a great deal of our quota, that's important to know. Knowing that we are here this time around to put the finishing touches, to reach a little degree of perfection so that the world will be perfect and Mashiach could come, th this is important information because it helps us appreciate and understand the possibility that one mitzvah can do the trick because it could be that one mitzvah that your soul was missing or is missing. And therefore it is realistic to think that one more mitzvah and the whole world will change. Because it's very possible that the entire world is waiting for your soul to finish its job. And your soul needs only one mitzvah to finish itself. So if you don't get on with that mitzvah, everybody's going to be angry at you. <laughs> the whole world will complain to you that you're messing everybody's life up by not doing your mitzvah. There was a writer who um, spent some time in Crown Heights, a psychologist. And one of the conclusions, one of the uh, discoveries that she made is that here are a group of people, and she was focused mainly on the teenagers, here are a group of teenagers who, whatever their personalities and whatever their issues in life, they all have one thing in common. They are all firmly convinced that what they do, the way they behave, how they act, will either make the world perfect or make the world worse. That is a very powerful awareness. It's a very empowering awareness. Your actions are not insignificant. They can determine the outcome, the result, for the entire universe. That's pretty awesome. And some of the people, some of the teenagers, labor under that awareness. It's too heavy for them. They don't want it. They want to just relax and have some fun and not care whether they're fixing the world or destroying it. But they can't. They can't. They've got the message. They feel the importance. And as much as they try to dismiss it, they really can't. Because what you do does make a difference. So knowing that there were past lives and that we are here for the third or fourth time around does make a difference because it explains things. It helps us understand 
It also explains a mysterious phenomenon, I think, that is unique to our generation. It's called chronic fatigue. Nobody understands where the chronic fatigue comes from. Knowing that you've been here before, this is your fourth lifetime, of course you're tired. <laughs> it's not a disease. We're exhausted. We wake up exhausted. We're born exhausted. It's like, oh no, not again. <laughs> and that also adds to the urgency of getting it all right so that we can stop with this already and have the world reach its perfection. And then what happens when the world reaches its perfection? All the finished parts, the completed parts of our soul come back to earth in their original body. So now you have multiple personalities, which is not a problem because each one has its own body, so they're not competing. So there'll be four of you, four of your mother, four of your father, four of your sister, four of your brother, four of your... It'll be a strange world, but it'll be a very good world. There's a, a classical story that is told about a guy who comes into a uh, tavern, a kretschme in Russia. He orders a drink, and he's about to drink it. He's got it to his lips, and uh, a hand restrains him. And he turns around, and it's the Balshemtiv. And the Baal Shem Tov says to him, before you drink that, I want to tell you a story. He says, everything in this world has a divine spark. In a human being, it's a full-blown soul with a complete personality and so on. But in everything, there is a spark. Every grain of wheat has a spark. And that spark is aware of its purpose or usefulness in this world. So there's this grain of wheat which the farmer has in his basket and he's walking down the uh, furrows, down the plowed field, and he's scattering these seeds, these kernels, planting them in his field. And every kernel is praying that it be planted properly and not be left in the basket and discarded. So the seed's prayers are answered and he is planted. He falls on the field, in the furrow, in the plowed part. Other seeds are not so lucky. They fall on the unplowed part and just spoil on the surface of the ground. But the seed that made it into the furrow is now covered by the soil and now it is praying with all its might that nothing should step on him, that an animal or a cartwheel should not crush it. And its prayers are answered and it starts to take root. Now it's praying for rain. And its prayers are answered and the rain comes. Now it's sprouting. Now it's praying with all its might that an animal doesn't eat it. And no animal eats it and it turns into a stalk of wheat. Now the farmer comes and he's harvesting. Many of the stalks are left behind, are lost, are discarded. He's praying with all his might not to be discarded. He's not discarded, he makes it into the bundle. Now bundles are left or forgotten. So the kernel of wheat now is praying that its bundle not be left. And it's not, it makes it onto the wagon. And on the wagon, on the way to the granary, or whatever it's called, many of the kernels get knocked off and are lost along the way, and this kernel is praying not to be lost. And it makes it to the silo, and from the silo to the, to the mill, and it is ground, and each step of the way it prays not to be lost. It finally makes it into the vat. And it's becoming vodka. Now it's in a bottle, and it's sitting on the shelf of a kretschma. And a Kozak comes in and orders a drink. And this kernel of wheat is praying, please, not me, not me. And then a Jew comes in and orders a drink. And the kernel in that bottle is praying, yes, me. 
and it gets poured into your glass, and you are about to drink it without a bracha. Had you done that, you would have ruined, in the last moment, the entire saga, the entire drama, all the prayers, all the hopes, all the history of this grain of wheat that wanted only that somebody should make a bracha on it. And suddenly the man remembered that he had yartzeit for his father that day because his father's soul was in that kernel of wheat. I'm not suggesting that every time we eat something we should worry about whose soul is in it. I'm suggesting that everything we do has the same drama behind it. When you have an opportunity to do a mitzvah, if we would stop and think, how many events did it take to bring you to this moment? What did it take? Let's talk about your being here this weekend, or just today, just now. What did it take for you to be here today? What did your grandmother have to do? What did your grandfather have to do? What did your parents go through before you could be born? What have you gone through since you were born that led to this day and to this event and to your being here today? It's mind-boggling. My father passed away about 30 days ago. And coming from Europe during those difficult years, we never really quite knew or heard exactly what went on there because, you know, the survivors don't talk. Just today, a man called up and said, I'd like to come over and visit. I knew your father in Europe. We were study partners for a couple of months in the yeshiva before the yeshiva was dismantled. So this, that's what I, what I was doing this afternoon listening to a little piece of history and finding out what was... So, how did my parents get married? Well, it was like this. You heard of a guy named Hitler? He came to Poland. And the Jews in Poland didn't want to stay there with him there. So they ran into Russia. The Russians didn't like foreigners. <laughs> so, so they sent them to Siberia. But they escaped from Siberia, and they made their way down to the Asian part of Russia, which was safer, down to the Ukraine, to Kazakhstan, to Uzbekistan, and so on. There he met my mother. And that's how it started. So how is it that I am here today? Well, it took a world war to get my parents together. And every step of the way, which could have been the end for either one of them, now, a lot of people perished in Siberia. A lot of people got stuck in Poland under the Nazis and couldn't get out. Many people got stuck in Uzbekistan and are still there. Every step of the way could have been the end, the end of a long road, but it wasn't. So all the string of miracles that were necessary in order to, uh, for me to be born, and then what happened since then, we all have this incredible history that brought us to this moment. If we don't do the right thing at this moment, are we wasting a minute? Are we wasting an opportunity? Or are we wasting the whole thing? Everything. So knowing that there was a past life enlarges the picture, making it even greater than we thought. It's not just your mother and your grandfather many years together. It's a past life as well. Maybe two past lives. Maybe this event or this moment that you're facing now is the culmination of three lifetimes going back to Mount Sinai. Actually, Kabbalah says that we, being the generation of Mashiach, the generation that is going to leave exile and come to the promised land permanently and forever, we are the same souls that left Egypt and never made it to Israel because we died in the desert. 
So now we're here to finish that journey. So literally speaking, we, all of us, left Egypt 3,315 years ago, and we're finally about to complete that journey with the coming of Mashiach. Are you saying that if, you, if one part of your soul got fixed in one of your lives, that that part doesn't come back again and you can't mess that part up again? Right. And then you're saying that when these parts come back, that one of my previous lives is going to be all Hesed in its body, and this, this body, when it comes back, is going to be all something else? Not all, because that's not a human being. Just Chesed is not a human being, that's an angel. But as, as we know from the counting of the Omer, in Chesed, there is a, uh, a blend of all the other attributes as well, but Chesed is the dominant one. And so it is with all of the attributes. So in each body, a different attribute will be the dominant attribute. And you see that in people today. You see people who are predominantly kind or predominantly angry or predominantly determined, or predominantly charismatic. And, of course, they have all the other qualities, but not as strong. So, it's a whole person, it's not... A so we really believe that one of my previous lives, or one of your previous lives, that my soul could have been that good in one of these attributes that it actually completed it? Yes, and it's very likely that in our past life, you were the teacher, and I was the student, and I didn't like what you were saying either. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just <laughs> Yeah. If a person doesn't have children, does that mean that they will in the next life, or they might have had it already in a previous life, and therefore this life is about something else? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Except that the Rebbe mentioned a few times that being so late in history, see, you can't be reincarnated immediately. When the soul gets back to heaven, it's not like, you know, uh, turn around and make a U-turn and go back to earth. That would be too intense or too whatever. So it takes, I don't know, 40 years, 100 years before the soul can come back for a reincarnation. And since Mashiach is so late and has to arrive at any minute, there's no time for reincarnations anymore. So this is it. We get it right this time. By the way, this explains, how is it that if we are reincarnated, how is it that you can go to your great-grandmother's grave and it has real significance, a place? Maybe your grandmother is standing next to you uh, visiting somebody else's grave because she's been reincarnated. So what's the point of going to her grave? It's because the part of the soul that did get completed in the body that is buried in this grave is forever connected, attached, emotionally uh, nostalgic for its body. So when you go to the place where the body was buried, you have more direct access to that soul, even though parts of that soul could be standing next to you. If, the number of soul, if, if every Jewish soul was at Sinai, is the number of souls constant how do we calculate that based on the number of people in incarnation? The number of souls is not constant. The soul of all Jews began in Avraham. There was one Jew. A few years later, there are 70 souls. Yaakov and his children. So one soul has now become 70. Those are the 70 souls who went down to Egypt. By the time we leave Egypt, there are 600,000 souls. That's a pretty good increase. And those 600,000 souls, as was the case with Avraham's soul, are collective souls, master souls. Avraham's soul contained within it all the future souls. All future souls were then contained within the 70 souls. All future souls were then contained within the 600,000 souls. So you have master souls, and then you have the branches and the offshoots. and the. So there is a constant number of master souls, 
but the individual souls keep increasing. But even there, there's a certain limited number of souls. When all those souls have completed their mission, the exile is over and it's time for Mashiach. So it can't go on forever. And that's why having a child helps bring Mashiach because there are souls waiting who need to get their turn at bat. They need to come down and do their thing so that Mashiach can come. Then after Mashiach comes, a whole new heaven of souls opens up and then new souls come into the world that are not reincarnations and they will live forever. Huh? What's their job? To serve God on earth, but not by fixing stuff because everything's fixed. So this is the thing. How do you serve God if not by fixing? How do you serve God when things are fixed? Prevent it from going bad? But there is no bad, so it can't go bad. So what do you... By turning things over with the spirit of happiness, totally uh, see with both eyes of goodness and kindness. But there's nothing to turn over, you see. Yeah. But today, we turn things over. We make the bitter sweet, we make the dark light, we make the, the evil good. But there's, there's going to come a time when there's nothing to turn over. There's nothing to fix and there's nothing to avoid because there's only goodness in the world. So how are we going to serve God then? This is like saying when you first get married, there's so much stuff going on. You know, you got to get used to each other. You got to stop getting on each other's nerves. You got to learn not to aggravate each other. You got to learn to make nice. You got to learn to make sure that uh, they're not going to regret marrying you. There's a lot of stuff to fix and to complete. What happens after you've been married for like 65 years? There's nothing. There's nothing to fix. There's nothing even to get to know. So do you not serve each other anymore? On the contrary, that's when you finally get to really serve each other. Not just try to patch things up. So the first 60 years are not the real thing. That's just a warm-up. That's batting practice, spring training. You get to the real thing 60 years later, because then you're too old to enjoy it. But that's the real, the true nature of a married relationship, is not when you're making the marriage work but when there is nothing more to do for the marriage. So then you are married, not because you want to be married, you're no longer making the marriage, now you are really married. And if that's not a goal, then what are you doing? There comes a time when you don't have to sacrifice your existence in order to have a life your existence and your life become the same thing. And that's what it's going to be like after Mashiach comes. Existence is going to be so comfortable. Existence will be so complete, so perfect, and we won't even notice because life will be so exciting. But today, if our existence becomes really good, it distracts us from life. Like Bill Gates. You got all the house you can use, all the security you can use, all the wealth you can use, all the health you can use, all the fame you can use, then what do you do? Then you turn around and say, so uh, what's the point of life? So when your existence becomes perfect, you realize that you've been neglecting your life. So you rush off to do something good. Help somebody, give charity, build something, do something. Because all you've done is guarantee your existence, your survival. So when Mashiach comes, we will be able to have a perfect existence because it will not distract us from our life. And that's what it's like after you've been married for 65 years. After Mashiach comes and we're just naturally good, how are we going to be different from angels? A number of things. First of all, angels feel no satisfaction 
they get no satisfaction from the holiness that they have because they didn't create it. They didn't do anything to achieve it. When Mashiach comes, of course, the world will be perfect, but not of itself. It will have been made perfect by our efforts and by our mitzvahs and by our sacrifices. So the goodness will not just be there, it will be the result or the, be or the reward of our mitzvahs so that it will feel not only holy but satisfying. So the big difference between us and angels is that we have freedom of choice. The result being, whatever we get, we deserved. We worked for it. So there's a fulfillment and a satisfaction from the holiness. And maybe that's why the Gemara says that even after Mashiach comes, we will remember the time we left Egypt and we will celebrate Pesach. And of course, the question is, why? You've got a bigger miracle now. Why remember the old one? Because that's what makes us different from angels. Angels have no memory. They celebrate nothing. Because they did nothing. But we will always remember that the holiness of Moshiach came from our struggles in Egypt and leaving Egypt and so on. Yeah? Is it true people come back because they want to come back? They ask you. Nobody asks to come back. See, we're very fickle. When you're here, you don't want to go back. When you're there, you don't want to come back. Wherever we are, we don't want to change. So if we're here, we don't want to go to heaven. If we're in heaven, we don't want to come back to earth. It's too traumatic to want it to happen. So as much as we know that heaven is beautiful, wonderful, comfortable, safe, we don't want to go there. And then when you get to heaven and you know how wonderful it is to be on earth where you can do mitzvahs and you can fight with people, you know, we don't want it because it's just too scary. So that idea that souls choose to come back and choose their parents, and ch no, that's not a Jewish concept. Yeah. You mean, will, will there still be kosher and non-kosher things? Yes, of course. The difference of, will be that the non-kosher will not be tempting. There'll be no temptation. There'll be no other agenda. Like, I want to serve God, but I also want to do that. They will be there as part of serving God, not as a distraction from serving God, not as an alternative to God, as part of God. You want to know everything about me? Then you got to know what I like and what I don't like. Not so that you can do it to me. <laughs> if I tell you I hate when you scratch the black boy, you say, okay, good, now I'll do it. So that's, that's the way we behave now. But after Mashiach comes, we'll find out what pleases God and what doesn't please God, and that will help us please Him, not tempt us to aggravate Him. So it's the temptation, it's the, it's the ugly side of existence that is going to disappear. Everything else will be fine. So there'll be no gates part? Right. Exactly. One, when you said that when we complete a certain part of our soul, like Chesed, said, then that will in a sense but on the on the other hand if your kindness has already been fulfilled in a past life you're not going to have a challenge oh. it's not going to be a challenge to be kind as an aspect within the other. It's like the kindness within whatever other attribute. But you see, this can also explain why people today are so rotten. <laughs> All the good parts have stayed in heaven. We're now working on the dregs. 
Our nastiest personalities are now here to be fixed. That was one question. There's a certain idea that when people get married, it's another part of their soul or that. So two souls, are they helping each other out to like fulfill both different aspects? Are, you, is, but are they working, supposed to work together to fulfill all the different parts of that? In each other. In each other. And that's, that's also why when two souls are reincarnated and they marry each other, that marriage is also part of this fixing process, and that's why you kind of give each other a hard time, because you're pushing all the right buttons. Those are the buttons that need to get fixed. So some guy once said to the Rebbe that he was suicidally and thinking of killing himself to put an end to his misery. So the Rebbe said, you're not going to put an end to your misery, you're just going to be born again with a suicidal tendency. So fix it this time around, what are you waiting for? So if you're challenged by a suicidal, you know, by the temptation to commit suicide, if you don't fix it in this lifetime, you'll just come back with it next time. And next time you won't even have the good qualities that you have now, because it'll be only that that will come back. So fix it now, don't wait for next time. So the same is true with marriage. If, you're, if in your marriage you find that there's a challenge and that your, your patience is being tested or your tolerance is being tested or your generosity is being tested or your sanity is being tested, that's okay. So do it. Pass the test. But don't complain about the test. Huh? Yeah, only for people who kill themselves. Because they didn't live their life through. Don't you think this is like a suicidal society? That this is sort of like the end of time? And what you're talking about maybe has to do with a particular Jewish kind of orientation about um, where, as a Jew, you would find yourself in this world that you create. But if the, if the world is destroyed and people cannot live together, what happens to, uh, or don't you think that that's a possibility, that this is sort of like the end of days? It is the end of days. The question is, how is it going to end? On a good note or on a bad note, that's the only... It's the end of days in a sense, and I'm sure every generation says this, but this time it's really true. <laughs> it's the end of days because this can't go on. You have weapons of mass destruction, and it can't go on because I don't see any way of resolving the kinds of conflicts that there are in this. Yeah. Know you know, it's, it's interesting. What is your answer? God forbid. But you see, m weapons of mass destruction, that seems to be everybody's uh, biggest concern. I don't think that's the biggest concern. Weapons of mass destruction can be controlled. If you don't push the button, nobody will get hurt. Okay. But when people are blowing themselves up, that's more dangerous. Because how do you stop that? You gotta wait till they're all blown up. I don't know. <laughs> well, well, let's let's okay, okay. Let's talk about Moshiach. We talk and talk and talk about Moshiach, and we don't really say anything. So, let's let's finally say something about Moshiach. Number one, Moshiach doesn't just drop down from heaven, because if that's what is supposed to happen. It could have happened at any time in the last 3,000 years. My husband is a survivor, was a survivor, and he said every day people pray to Moshiach, and Moshiach comes down, and then they went, you know, they prayed, and then they went up on the metal gates, and they were electrocuted. Yeah. He said this was a very common thing. He so, said if Moshiach was going to come, he can, and he told me, he didn't believe in it because he said it didn't happen. He said okay. Moshiach is not going to drop down from heaven. Moshiach is the outgrowth of all the years of our devotion and commitment and observance and self-sacrifice. Moshiach is the result. He's not a new beginning. So it's very wrong to think that the world is a big mess. It's an ugly world. 
but something holy and good will come from some other place, call it heaven, and it will be wonderful. It will be a whole new thing, and the old will go away, and the new will replace it, and it's going to be... That is very unkosher, very un-Jewish. Mashiach is the result of our mitzvahs. He cannot come on his own. He can't drop down from heaven. He has got to blossom out of the mitzvahs that we have invested into this world. So, why should it take thousands of years for Mashiach to come? He could drop down from heaven in a minute. What's with the thousand years? It's because Mashiach comes out of our effort, not from heaven. So it's our effort that brings a perfect world. Mashiach is just the conductor. Mashiach is just the, um, the catalyst that causes this, this final production to all happen in an orderly fashion and so on. But what is happening is our mitzvahs, our service, our efforts, our tears, our pain, that's what brings Mashiach. Now, what's going to happen when Mashiach comes? There will be a resurrection of the dead. Our ancestors will come back to life. These are all very strange, exotic things. And that's not what we need to believe about Mashiach. What we need to believe about Mashiach is simply this. God created the world to be good, to be a good world. So far, that has not happened. But it must. God's plan can't fail. So the belief in Mashiach is basically the belief that God's plan will succeed and this world will someday be perfect. Not to believe that is not to believe in anything. If you don't believe that, it's not that you're not believing in God, you're not believing in earth. You're not believing in the destiny of the human race. You're not believing in goodness. Or on the flip side, you're worshiping evil. So people who say, oh, come on, there have always been wars, there will always be wars. That's worshiping war. That's making war into an eternal truth. There will always be wars. War is not eternal. That's idol worship. So what does it mean to believe in Mashiach? It simply means to believe that the world as it is now is not as good as it gets, in spite of those advertisements. It don't get no better than this. Oh, yes, it does. It will. It has to. So, Mashiach means, I believe the world will someday be appropriate for God, worthy of God, which is what he created it for. Now, I don't know how to make that happen. So, I'm waiting for somebody who knows how to make it happen. And I call him Mashiach. But what is going to happen? What am I so sure must happen? I'm not sure somebody has to come. I'm sure that the perfection has to come. So, somebody come and make it happen. So the belief in Mashiach is not really even a religious belief. It's a necessary human belief. So you stop a guy in the street and say, excuse me, you think life is going to go on the way it is today with bombings and suicides and chemical... He says, no, of course not. It can't go on like this. It's got to get better. I said, well, then you believe in Mashiach. 